Uh, I'm the Vice President of Mesosphere's Europe, Middle East, and Africa region. Uh, I have here Flora Niedermeyer, uh, who you just heard from a few minutes ago, uh, who represents the, uh, the, the German broader uh, Dach market. Um, so uh, please don't hesitate to come up to either of us afterwards with any questions you have. So starting off, um, a show of hands, how many people have heard of Mesosphere before? Wow. <laughs> That's terrific. Um, you know, to be honest, we're, we're a small company. We've been a small company for a while. We're, we're growing very quickly. Um, we are not used to having such a large proportion of people uh, in rooms that have heard about us. So that's uh, it's a very strong statement. Thank you very much for, uh, for your support. Um, first to start off, we'll be focusing on Kubernetes today. Uh, but I just want to take a few seconds to talk about our, uh, our broader platform, Mesosphere DCOS. Now, DCOS stands for Distributed Cloud Operating System. The concept of DCOS is to allow you to run any combination of cloud-native workloads in a very intelligent, well-orchestrated way. So if you look up here, we have a broad coverage of workloads. Uh, you see here on the left, uh, DevOps, CI, CD, container-oriented tools. And you see on the right here, all sorts of data services, machine learning, real-time analytics, distributed databases like Mongo, Cassandra, etc. cetera. Um, the idea with DCOS is to allow you to run all of these types of workloads in an intelligent, orchestrated way without regard to state, without regard to infrastructure that they're running on, uh, without regard to location. Um, this gives you the ability to treat all workloads essentially the same. Uh, and that's the magic of DCOS. Uh, in addition to that, we provide application-aware orchestration. So as you know, part of the challenge of running some stateless workloads as containerized services uh, is that, unfortunately, it's very difficult to abstract state. And so what we've allowed uh, our customers to do is to take application-aware automation, treat different workloads the way they deserve to be treated, to build intelligence into uh, the platform so that if you have, for example, an Elasticsearch cluster that falls down, that's a very different remedy than if you have some stateless Docker containers that fall down. Maybe you need to you know, restart an entirely new cluster. Maybe you need to restart another master node and have that node join the cluster. Um, if your Kafka uh, cluster falls down, Maybe you need another broker node and need to update the IP addresses uh, for the rest of the broker nodes so everyone knows who's doing what. Uh, these are different things that are very, very complex when it comes to uh, installation, configuration, when it comes to scalability, you know, if you need to add nodes to your cluster, if you need to do upgrades, move from one version to the next. All of these processes can become more and more and more complex when you have these questions of state involved. So our, the fact that we have application-aware automation, that we can program that intelligence into the way that we treat uh, these deployments, these configurations, these failovers, et cetera, uh, gives you a much, much better user experience. We also provide intelligent resource pooling. So underneath the covers of Mesosphere DCOS uh, is Apache Mesos, where the name Mesosphere comes from. Apache Mesos does one thing, and it does it better than anything else on the planet. And that is pooling and serving up infrastructure resources into one common pool. Mesos itself does not have to be aware of what your applications are doing. That's what the orchestration layer does. Mesos itself is providing the infrastructure as one single pool, making offers to the application tier uh, so that the application tier can be intelligent with what it consumes. And then the fourth thing that we do with Mesosphere DCOS is automated, unified cloud operations. So we don't care if you want to run on the public cloud, we don't care if you want to run on your private cloud, if you want to run on VMware, Hyper-V, KVM, whatever it is, as long as you can run Linux, you can run Mesosphere DCOS. And you can run a unified cluster across those disparate environments. So if you want to have most of your workloads running on-premise because maybe you have uh, very strict data requirements, but you want to be able to burst into the cloud for certain workloads based on, you know, perhaps uh, seasonality, based on cost. That's something that we can support. So in a, in a, essentially, this gives you the full public cloud experience 
across your infrastructures, across your applications, across your different types of projects. You don't have to lock yourself into one single cloud provider to have this automated click button type of service. So moving forward, one of the uh, workloads that we support and that is be quickly becoming one of the most popular workloads is Kubernetes. Kubernetes, as most of you probably know, is um, the leading container orchestrator on the market. Um, most vendors in the software space have some sort of story around Kubernetes, whether they support it, they integrate with it, they deploy it, they uh, you know, can consume its APIs, whatever it is. Uh, it's quickly becoming the behemoth in the market. But doing Kubernetes right is a very, very, very difficult task. Has anyone in this room ever tried to install Kubernetes? Show of hands, manually? Okay, yeah, I feel your pain. <laughs> um, it, it's very complex. Uh, it, it's a very intelligent system, of course. It, it does uh, what it does very well. Um, but when it comes to management, it's incredibly difficult. Uh, so doing Kubernetes right means a few things. First of all, it needs to be automated. If you're having to manually heal Kubernetes every time there's a little bit of a bug, uh, every time you have a, a workload that doesn't perform quite as well as you expect, uh, that's a challenge. Um, that's gonna require a lot of extra time and motion. Uh, it needs to be evergreen. So Kubernetes, as most of you know, is an extremely quickly evolving open source project. Every couple months you got another minor version, a couple months later you got another major version. Uh, we have some of the other players in our space that are still supporting previous versions like Kubernetes 1.7 or 1.8. Uh, we're now on 1.11. whatever. I don't even know what the most recent version is as of last week. Um, having the ability to stay up to date and to quickly involve uh, the new features that are provided in Kubernetes is a, is a key part of doing Kubernetes right. There's, there's no sense in using a very, very quickly evolving, uh, fast, innovative technology if you're always gonna be six months behind. So that's an important key piece of why running Kubernetes on DCOS is running it right. Second, or thirdly, excuse me, um, Kubernetes needs to be included in the offering. So if you're looking to, to consume Kubernetes, um, having little you know, bits and pieces that you have to add on, uh, provide additional packages and, and additional costs onto what you're, uh, you're consuming with your provider, um, that makes it difficult because, of course, you know, Kubernetes is a very dynamic, very elastic uh, type of system. You don't necessarily know uh, exactly what you're going to consume. If you're paying by the transaction or if you're paying by the CPU or if you're paying by the app, uh, you can quickly become uh, inundated with um, extra superfluous costs. So we include Kubernetes in our offering and we support it. Um, so your cost is very, very predictable. Uh, in addition, it's important for Kubernetes to be open source, open standards. Some of the players in the market offer Kubernetes as part of a platform, and then they've wrapped Kubernetes with proprietary APIs. Uh, they use a completely separate interface, and Kubernetes is essentially something that helps them underneath the covers in terms of providing their platform as a service or whatever. Uh, the challenge with that is that every time Kubernetes has a new version that comes out, those actors have to completely sort of redo those APIs, redo the interface to, to leverage all these new capabilities. Uh, whereas on the Mesosphere side, we can run Kubernetes on top of our platform just like we can run Elasticsearch, just like we can run um, you know, Apache Kafka, just like we can run Cassandra, uh, GitLab, uh, Jenkins, any of these other components. Um, every time a new version comes out, we have a little bit of testing to do maybe a little bit of work for a few days, um, but, but on average, when new minor versions of Kubernetes come out, they're supported within a week or two on Mesosphere DCOS. Compare that to, as we mentioned earlier, some of these actors in our space who are still six months, eight months, 11 months behind in some cases. Uh, and lastly, Kubernetes needs to be unified. Doing containers and Kubernetes by itself is a, is a big piece of the puzzle, but it's not the whole puzzle. Uh, when you're looking at a development pipeline, when you're trying to do cloud native applications, you need things like Jenkins for CI, CD. Maybe you want to use Spinnaker. Maybe you need uh, an artifactory, so you're going to use JFrog. Or uh, you know, perhaps you want to try and, and use Bitbucket to see how, how that works, right? Um, these are different pieces of the entire process um, that, that need to be integrated with a container strategy. Um, so we provide access and, uh, and support for all of those things. Uh, lastly, in order to do Kubernetes right, you need to do it securely. 
uh, and why do you need to do it securely? Well, uh, at the last time we looked, uh, which was I think a few weeks ago, there were 20,000 Kubernetes dashboards freely accessible on the internet. Some of them running very, very mission critical services. Um, doing Kubernetes yourself is complex enough without having to think about security. But when you have to start thinking about security, um, and you're just a, you know, maybe a small line of business running within a much larger company, there isn't necessarily as much oversight, it's very easy for those types of folks to um, skip steps. So that's a, a very important piece. We'll talk about one example of, uh, of how this hurt uh, a, a very popular brand that perhaps most of you know. So in, in terms of DCOS and Kubernetes, we automate uh, Kubernetes in, uh, in a very intelligent way, providing access to the entire lifecycle management of Kubernetes. That's deployment, as we mentioned, that's configuration, uh, that's sizing and resizing, that's upgrades to the latest version of Kubernetes in a rolling upgrade format, single click upgrades. Um, and of course, uh, when it's time to spin down uh, the service, you know, we, uh, we automate that as well. Uh, we allow you to run Kubernetes as a service for individual teams, and not just different versions of Kubernetes, um, but multiple instances of Kubernetes on the same infrastructure. Uh, we're the only provider in the marketplace that can do that today. So you could have, for example, one line of business consuming Kubernetes 1.9.6, uh, a development team that decides they want to move forward on 1.11.4 because the latest version of Istio is really cool, you have another team that still has an application that is coded to you know, Kubernetes 1.8, so they want to stay back behind a few versions. Mesosphere gives you the ability to deploy all of those different versions and orchestrate them intelligently and to share infrastructure resources across those different versions. Very, very, very powerful capability. And lastly, as we mentioned, you can even run your CI CD pipeline and all your DevOps tools on that same platform. So here's a um, illustration of how this might work in terms of the different options you have once you decided you wanted to run Kubernetes. So obviously Kubernetes was designed by Google. You can easily consume it on the public clouds, including Google, um, you provide, who provide infrastructure automation underneath. We provide that same capability across any infrastructure. So whether you're running on-premise bare metal, whether you're running on a virtual infrastructure, whether you're running on one public cloud or multiple public clouds, we give you that same, uh, that same orchestration capability with Apache Mesos. Um, obviously, all of these different options, um, whether it's GKE, whether it's Mesosphere, whether it's do-it-yourself, or in a PaaS environment, you have usually some form of Kubernetes uh, baked in. Um, but if you look at the PaaS offerings, as we mentioned, all of these proprietary APIs uh, are, are written around Kubernetes, and so anytime something within Kubernetes changes, you have all these additional changes that have to be made by that vendor. Um, so we obviously promote not forking the Kubernetes distribution and staying with the, the, the standard uh, capability. Um, and then of course, with all of the different CI CD tools that we automate, you can run your Jenkins, multiple versions of Jenkins, you can run GitLab, you can run uh, any number of, of different uh, services and frameworks that allow you to get the most value out of your Kubernetes. So looking in terms of how Kubernetes and how Mesosphere fit into the broader uh, ecosystem of containers, um, obviously on the bottom you see uh, Apache Mesos, uh, which is an intelligent resource management uh, service. Um, you have, of course, classical resource management services like Ansible, Puppet, Salt, Chef, etc., uh, or some you know, very cloud-specific resource management capabilities like uh, CloudFormation. Um, but, uh, but Apache Mesos is an intelligent resource manager uh, that allows you to be very dynamic in terms of the resources that you provide and uh, to be very deliberate, uh, deliberate excuse me, in doing so. Uh, above the resource management layer, you have a choice of many, many, many different orchestrators. The two most popular are Kubernetes and Marathon, and we support both of those. Uh, Kubernetes is especially popular with developers uh, because obviously you know, Google is a very developer-friendly company. They developed Kubernetes. Um, there's just a, a crazy ecosystem and open source community around it. Uh, and it's very, very easy to find um, you know, help and pointers and, uh, and online support for all things involving Kubernetes. Uh, one of the things that Kubernetes um, folks find difficult, however, is running stateful services. 
So obviously running stateless containers is very easy. Kubernetes was designed for that, uh, but, but dealing with state is very difficult. And we'll show you a quote from someone at Google in a couple slides that discusses this. But Marathon, on the other hand, uh, is really, really popular with operators, and it's popular with, um, with admins. Why? Because it allows you to more easily manage those stateful workloads, it's easier to operate, um, and, and so we decided to support both of these um, container orchestrators on top, of, uh, on top of Apache Mesos in Mesosphere DCOS. But they're not the only ones. So we have um, some of our customers like Netflix, uh, YouTube, and Twitter, uh, Yelp, um, Uber, a few others, uh, use other orchestrators on top of Apache Mesos that run uh, just as well as, uh, as Kubernetes and Marathon. Uh, some of those are Titus, uh, Aurora, uh, and there are a few others. Um, one's called Pasta, I think, is the one that, uh, that Yelp runs. Um, and then, of course, you have different choices for runtimes and container formats and everything else, all of which you know, will support. Um, so it gives you really, again, the, the choice in different, um, different tools. Um, in terms of how to deploy and manage uh, and, and run a Kubernetes initiative, um, there are a number of different choices. If you're just using Kubernetes in development, um, perhaps you're not so concerned about security. Maybe you're not going to have any critical data uh, running on Kubernetes, so you can afford to just kind of do it yourself manually. Um, and, and that's a choice. It's, uh, it's it's not necessarily a, a bad choice, um, but it can be a bad choice, uh, and, and here's why. It's incredibly difficult, as we discussed, to deploy and manage, uh, upgrade, scale, etc. cetera. Um, so you need people who are extremely skilled in that. You need lots of those people. In addition to that, um, if you have changes or things that you'd like to see in future versions of Kubernetes uh, to help you with your business, you need to make pull requests. And it's been documented. If you see the slides afterwards, there's links in here so you can find uh, all the information about that. Those pull requests. Hello? Those pull requests can sit dormant for years. That's not an exaggeration. We went and found pull requests that sat dormant for over two years. Um, so that's incredibly difficult to deal with when you're trying to build a business that depends on Kubernetes. So again, in, in development, maybe that's okay. Um, when you start moving applications towards production, uh, absolutely not tolerable. You can do uh, DIY configuration management with tools like COPS or Cube Spray. Um, it's a little bit better, easier. To um, however, you do have to deal with security still by yourself. Um, those tools don't automate security. Uh, and also, you still have the issue with pull requests that can sit dormant for many, many years. Uh, and then you don't necessarily get all of the auxiliary components around CI, CD, around uh, automation, agile development. Um, so many organizations have taken to using uh, vendor configuration management. So we have uh, you know, our friends at HashiCorp here who offer a, a really compelling tool in that space. Um, and, uh, and, and we you know, integrate with that tool for the deployment of Mesosphere DCOS. It's called Terraform. You'll hear more about it. Um, the challenge with that, however, is that again, if, if that's the only thing you're using, uh, you're still um, relying on hard-coded infrastructure. So if you need your infrastructure to, to change and evolve over time, then you have to basically do you know, redeployment, reconfiguration of those things. So at the container orchestration layer, um, really, most organizations have now gravitated towards this, um, you know, fuller, more vertically integrated solution, which has been traditionally the cloud providers. So Google offers a completely integrated stack. Uh, Microsoft does as well through Azure. Um, obviously, with Amazon, they have uh, something very similar in EKS. Um, the challenge, of course, with that is then you're locked to one provider. So if you're on AWS this year, uh, Microsoft calls next year and says, hey, Here's a wonderful deal on an ELA, and hey, you know what? We're going to throw in Microsoft Azure for free. It's been known to happen. Well, shoot, I've already hard-coded my applications to the Amazon APIs. Uh, I've already started using Kinesis. I've already started using Fargate. Now I've got to you know, rip and replace all of those components with the Microsoft Azure equivalent. Uh, and then the next year, Google calls up and says, hey, here's a great ELA, and you have to do it all over again. Um, in addition to that, because you're locked in, um, those services tend to be the highest margin. So to a certain extent, you know, consuming, um, consuming uh, VMs in the cloud is not very expensive. Consuming storage in the cloud is not very expensive. But when you get to these higher you know, value-added services in the cloud, those are very high-margin services. 
and, uh, and that's where the clouds make their money. And the billing is very complex. They'll charge you by transaction, they'll charge you by application, they might charge you by container or by cluster or by pod. Um, and it's really difficult to predict in advance exactly how you'll consume that. So what we've done again as Mesosphere is we provide that cloud native capability across any infrastructure, allowing you to use completely open standards tools. So instead of using Kinesis, you'd use Apache Kafka, which is you know, a leading, uh, leading message bus um, and uh, message queuing uh, service uh, in the marketplace. This allows you to, um, to really reduce the cost and to especially make it much more predictable as you grow your business. And you can deploy it anywhere. You can deploy it in Amazon, you can deploy it in Microsoft, you can deploy it in Google, so that when Microsoft calls you with that awesome ELA, you can be as flexible as you want to be to make the most out of those negotiations. Um, but again, we're not just talking about Kubernetes, we're also talking about the entirety of, uh, of the development pipeline. So you've got your source code control, you've got the ability to build and test you know, with Jenkins, GitLab, Spinnaker, which we support. Um, when you want to manage your release cycles, uh, you want to use CI CD tools like you know, JFrog, um, and then of course, when it's time to deploy, monitor, log, et cetera, uh, we give you the full suite of tools to do that, um, whether you want to use Prometheus or Elasticsearch or integrate with artificial intelligence and other uh, interesting data service components. Uh, so here's what it might look like when you get all of this running in production. Maybe you've got multiple lines of business and uh, they all want to run Kubernetes, but they don't necessarily need the same version and they don't necessarily need the same tools. When you're running in production, maybe you don't need all the development tools, but you might need uh, management for your NoSQL databases. Um, and so Mesosphere DCOS as one single set of infrastructure allows you to run all these multiple versions of these multiple different tools uh, and, and to manage them basically in the same way that you would your cloud resources, which is you don't have to manage them, they're just there. Uh, and when you need to scale them, they'll scale. When you need to upgrade them, they'll upgrade, and it's all automated. So why would you want to run multiple Kubernetes clusters, though, in the first place? Um, we'll take the example of CERN, um, which is uh, near and dear to my heart as a science and a physics aficionado. Uh, they run uh, hundreds of clusters of Kubernetes uh, daily. Um, and, and the reason they do this is for security and compliance reasons, primarily. Uh, obviously, within Kubernetes, you have the ability to use namespaces to segment uh, individual environments. Uh, but that's not always bulletproof, uh, and it especially doesn't always please the regulators. Um, and so uh, having the ability to completely separate clusters, to assign resources to each cluster, and allow each team to, to to have full autonomy within their cluster allows you to go fast and still you know, please the regulators and still be secure. Um, CERN was worried about two things, the concept of the, of the noisy neighbor, which means that other applications and other teams might consume your resources and might make it difficult for your application to be performant. But they were also concerned about nosy neighbors, which is data not necessarily being entirely walled off and some teams having access to uh, the applications and data of other teams. Um, so both of those concerns uh, were, were very, very strong at CERN, and given that they're working with such high power, uh, high impact uh, services, they decided it was best to run multiple clusters. Um, so they, they needed to provide full API access to their developers, uh, which they didn't want to do through, uh, through namespaces. Uh, and they had all sorts of different types and profiles of workloads, uh, which of course makes sense to, to do in separate clusters. Um, so now that they've done this, it's easier for them to manage scaling, provisioning, uh, and independent life cycles. Uh, so here's what you might find in terms of density when you deploy this in production. You can run essentially your GitLab, your Jenkins, and your Kubernetes, maybe multiple versions, or especially multiple instances of Kubernetes, all on the same infrastructure and share resources across that infrastructure. So instead of having you know, redundant uh, silos of Kubernetes, each you know, with the, the VMware tax, each with the uh, overhead of the operating system. Now you can segment them in a containerized way and, uh, and, and have you know, 75, 80 plus percent capacity utilization instead of sitting around at an average of 15 to 20 with some spikes uh, by running in silos. So much, much more cost effective. Um, here's a, uh, a screenshot um, from one example of a customer uh, I think it's actually a fictitious customer that we did for the demo here, but um, you can see that we're deploying three different clusters of Kubernetes 
on three different versions. We got a 1.10.5 running in Azure, a 1.10.6 uh, running on premise, a 1.11.3 running in Amazon West. Uh, they all have assigned resources, um, and if uh, if we needed to, you know, share kubelets across those clusters on individual nodes, we could do that. Uh, you see here that the Amazon cluster is also running CI/CD tools. Cause that's a pre-production cluster. Uh, and then you have the production cluster on premise that is running all sorts of uh, heavy data services like Spark, Kafka, Cassandra, et cetera. Uh, and you see, of course, that we can update uh, in, in rolling upgrade fashion um, each of these services. Um, why would you want to go with hybrid cloud? So we talked a little bit about the cloud providers and how being locked in is not necessarily a good thing. Uh, I don't know how many of you follow Hacker News. Um, Hacker News is a, is, is a really, uh, really cool resource to follow um, the most recent developments. Uh, and here this morning, so this is as of two hours ago, uh, the top news story on Hacker News is that Google's Kubernetes engine is on its third consecutive day of service disruptions. This is one of the three major cloud providers in the world, the one that developed Kubernetes, and their own cloud Kubernetes service has had its third straight day of service disruptions. Uh, now, this is very rare. This doesn't happen all the time, uh, of course. Um, however, the, the question becomes, when this happens, and, this, and next time it might be Amazon, next time it might be Azure, next time it might be you know, your private data center provider uh, that can't keep things up and running. When you have problems with your infrastructure, what is your recourse? How long does it take you to move things to another cluster? If you're running Kubernetes on Mesosphere DCOS, it's as simple as clicking a couple buttons, spinning out a couple more nodes on another cloud provider's infrastructure, redeploying Kubernetes, and in less than 10 minutes, you're, you're up and running. And we'll show you an example of how DCOS can even automate that process for you. So here, uh, Kubernetes on DCOS 1.12, we have simple HA cluster provisioning. Um, so the, the hands that raised earlier about uh, deploying um, and configuring Kubernetes, it's a 21 step process and many of those steps have several sub steps and if you need to do security and HA then there's even more steps after that. Uh, we've automated all of that, um, including the security and including the HA. Uh, into one single command line that you can do either through the, the CLI or uh, through the interface in DCOS. Uh, so that's just, uh, that's just the deployment aspect, but in terms of upgrading, in terms of scaling, it's, it's all the same thing. We reduce you know, 15, 20 steps into one or two steps. So we'll talk about auto repair. So you see here, you've got multiple servers running multiple kubelets um, on DCOS. Let's say you have one server go down. Um, and then those, uh, those kubelets, obviously, that are running on that server disappear because the server's down, it's no longer available. What Mesosphere will do is reinstate those kubelets. And not only will they reinstate those kubelets, they will have those kubelets rejoin the clusters they were associated to. They'll update the IP addresses. They'll make sure the API servers know how to reroute things. They'll, they'll get the virtual network uh, infrastructure back into place, uh, all in the space of a few minutes. And then when you restore that server, they'll put the Kubernetes worker node back on that server and migrate those kubelets back to the server they're supposed to be on. So this is what DCOS does. It does that for Kubernetes. But, um, it also does that for data services. It also does that for your CI CD tools uh, and everything that you need in your development lifecycle. We talked a little bit earlier about security uh, and how the, you had 20,000 Kubernetes clusters that were exposed to the open internet. Uh, a few of those clusters belong to this company, Tesla. I assume most of you know Tesla. Uh, I'm a fan myself. Um, I'm on the waiting list for one of their cars. Um, they, uh, they have um, a Kubernetes cluster that they had exposed to the internet, and Bitcoin miners were able to find that cluster and use Tesla's cluster to mine Bitcoin. They consumed about, I think it was a couple hundred thousand dollars worth of resources, infrastructure resources that belong to in order to mine these Bitcoins. Um, that's a problem, right? It's a problem. Uh, if, if your infrastructure is available to other people to be able to mine Bitcoin, it's a problem. So we recommend, obviously, installing Kubernetes and configuring it in a very secure HA way, uh, and that's what DCOS can provide. So uh, we provide secure authentication, authorization, and in-transit data encryption. 
Uh, we talked earlier about partnering with HashiCorp. We use uh, one of their technologies in our secret store, uh, which is a, a, a key component to DCOS as well. Uh, we enable the authentication of users uh, to use your single sign-on and your Active Directory and LDAP uh, resources to authenticate. Uh, we support full encryption, uh, both in transit and at rest, of, uh, of services and data running on DCOS. Uh, and we, uh, we support one-click configuration of TLS. Uh, we significantly reduce operational overhead and allow you to manage all of these security capabilities in a very easy, seamless way. So you can automate your entire stack, secure your entire stack, provide HA across your entire stack um, for, for all of your entire uh, CICD and development pipeline. Broad workload coverage, full cloud native services, uh, and all the tools your developers need to develop these applications in a very cloud native way. Um, we talked a little bit earlier about Google. Um, this is uh, Kelsey Hightower. Um, any of you familiar with him? A few? Yeah, he, he's basically Mr. Kubernetes at Google. Uh, he's the one that speaks at all of their big uh, symposia and uh, at their conferences. Um, he you know, leads a couple of the technical teams there. Um, he's a really big fan, obviously, of Kubernetes. Uh, he's part of the engineering team and, uh, and the folks that, uh, that promote and develop that. Um, here's what he said about uh, stateful services on Kubernetes. He says, Kubernetes has made huge improvements in the ability to run stateful workloads, including databases and message queues, but I still prefer not to run them on Kubernetes. Now, why, why would he say that? He's obviously one of the key proponents of Kubernetes, and this is only you know, back in February. This is less than nine months ago. Um, he said that basically because um, Kubernetes was des designed to run stateless containers. Uh, and it does that very well. It's, it's in many people's opinion, uh, the best or one of the best ways to run containers. Uh, however, while Google uh, and Kubernetes are able to quickly provision some of these state services, they don't have the application-aware automation that is built into DCOS. So, uh, you don't have the ability to self-heal stateful services. You don't have the ability to rejoin the same clusters they were a part of when you have to fail over. You don't have that automatic updating of all of the uh, virtual network uh, infrastructure. Um, those are the things that Mesosphere DCOS does very well, and even Google's own um, you know, uh, Kubernetes people are promoting the idea that stateful workloads are different and require a different type of, uh, of support. So having the ability to still run your stateful workloads and Kubernetes on the same infrastructure, to still have automatic service discovery, but to be able to use the best fit orchestration tool for each uh, is a key differentiator and will allow you to go faster and farther with, uh, with your containers. So in short, uh, security, interoperability, uh, and easy management are the key differentiators um, for Mesosphere DCOS and why it makes sense to use it for your high-density, multiple Kubernetes uh, projects. Uh, in terms of our uh, qualifications in the Kubernetes market, um, we are one of the few cloud-native uh, Container Foundation certified Kubernetes versions. Uh, we are an original member of the Open Container Initiative. We were a founding member of the Container Storage Interface Project, uh, allowing all storage uh, questions running on containerized infrastructure to be resolved via open standards. Uh, and this is quickly becoming an important thing if you've delved into uh, you know, storage in your containerized infrastructure uh, in the last six months. There's been a lot that has come from the, uh, from the CSI. Uh, and we're also uh, a founder, one of our founders, excuse me, is on the CNCF board, and we are a platinum member of, uh, of the CNCF. Um, in terms of resources, what you have uh, available to, to learn more, um, you can, of course, go to our uh, Kubernetes DCOS quick start page. Um, so we've got, you know, a uh, repository there that you can consult. Uh, there's an open source version of Mesosphere DCOS you can freely download install Kubernetes on it. Uh, if you need some of the more important security features that are available in the enterprise version, uh, we can help you with that. Um, there's our GitHub page there, uh, and we even have a live demo um, that we've, uh, we've recorded and, uh, and put with uh, Flink for analytics and Kubernetes running on the same infrastructure, and there's a link for that. 
Um, you can also sign up for our Slack channel. So uh, we have a, a standard DCOS uh, customer and community channel, and then we also have a, a, a Kubernetes channel. Um, so you can you know, provide uh, requests and, uh, and, and ask for help on that channel if you need to. Um, we will be at KubeCon North America next month um, in Seattle. I don't know if anyone here is going, but, uh, but if you are, please come find us at our booth. Uh, and you'll have the opportunity to sign up for a free invitation to IceCubeCon. So Mesosphere was fortunate. Uh, I, I guess the timing worked out perfectly. Uh, we were able to get IceCube to come to KubeCon with us and perform uh, at a concert. So you'll have KubeCon, and then in the evening you'll have IceCubeCon uh, with, uh, with some music and some dancing and some drinks and, uh, and all sorts of fun stuff. So we'll have some, some VIP passes that we'll be raffling if uh, any of you folks want to actually meet IceCube. Uh, kind of cool. I'm a big fan. So anyway, um, that's our content. So thank you very much for listening.